My name is Kate McIver, and I am your host for this session with Scott McDonald, co-founder at Modern Accelerator, and Verma at VP Customer Development at Alpha on We Can't Build Tomorrow Using to Yesterday's Tools, the Evolving Face of Change. So much has changed lately in the worlds of not only product design and innovation, but for everything else, <laughs> that many leaders aren't fully aware of the new possibilities. Today, uh, Scott and Verma will review the recent advances in teams, tools, and techniques, and how they're coming together to create a new world of possibilities for organizations. He'll also share a real-world case study of modern innovation in action. Now, before I hand over the mic, I want to make sure that you know how to engage with Scott and Verma as we want this session to really address your actual issues. So please share your questions via the Q&A, and I will feed them uh, to Scott and Verma for them to address. And if you want to be on mic, please raise your hand via the Zoom tool. And you can also use the chat to engage with others on the call. So as I hand it over, uh, please go into the chat, type in your name, where you're from, and what your main question is for the session. And Scott, over to you to get us started. Thanks, Kate. Very excited to be here today. It's been a, been a great program so far. And I'm especially delighted to have Anurag Verma here co-presenting with me today. Uh, Verma is a VP of Customer De Development at Alpha, which is the uh, rapid consumer feedback platform. He also happens to be uh, host of one of the world's most popular product management podcasts. So he has a lot of great stories to tell, and he's going to be sharing one of the more interesting of those stories with us today. Um, we're going to just jump right in and, uh, and say that uh, we're going to share a, a provocative statement with you. Um, and it's this, it's just, it's never been easier to make change successfully in organizations than it is today. And consequently, uh, you know, we have this unprecedented ability today, you know, to read the market in real time, change course, and make the future without guessing. Um, and that's not something we've been able to do in the past. And that's something that's exciting. I think these changes have snuck up on many of us. And so we're not fully appreciative of, of what, what's, what we're capable of right now. And consequently, you know, organizations are still struggling. And this is, a, this is, a, a, this is from David Bland of Strategizer. It's, it's a graphic that he's been publishing, as you can see, for, for a number of years now. It's a favorite of ours. And I guess uh, when, he does, when he does stop uh, publishing this, I guess that will mean we've, we've turned the corner as, as organizations. But you know, before we continue, um, we have a poll. We wanted to get a sense of uh, what folks on, in the session, you know, think of this statement. Do they are they seeing the same thing that it's getting easier to innovate faster with more certainty, uh, or are we crazy here? Great. Okay, here are the results for you. Okay, wonderful. That's actually I, I thought it would be a majority, but it, that's even much higher than I expected. Uh, Verma, what do you think? Is that is that higher than you expected? Um, I think. You know, uh, I think it's, it's, it's on, in line with what I expected, you know. Um, I think everything you're saying is really resonating, that the barriers have fallen and there is more sort of noise and enthusiasm around in innovation at the moment. Well, I guess uh, it'll be interesting to, to see then, uh, you know, what people are thinking about the particulars of what we're going to share today. So, you know, kind of jumping into things, you know, we have a number of trends that we'd like to talk about very quickly today because I think the story that Verma is going to tell is going to bring this all together in a very real way. And it's a great story. And I want to make sure we have all, enough time for that. So uh, I'm going to move quickly. Uh, we're going to talk about three trends that aren't new, but they're really accelerating in the last few years. Two, two accelerators that are a little, little new-ish. And, uh, and then this great story that Verma is going to tell about a Fortune 500 company in a, in a, in a highly regulated industry with it, with it a reputation for stodginess that launched a brand new digital business aimed at a new generation of customers in just five months taking advantage of these trends. So, you know, the three, three, the three trends have to do with teams, techniques, and tools. And more specifically with teams, you know, they're getting smaller, they're getting more versatile, and they're getting more autonomous. And uh, this is for a number of reasons. You know, if previously we had a lot of different departments involved in product or innovation, uh, a lot of different types of expertise, and, you know, working together, you might have a dozen or two dozen people, uh, you know, involved in, in an initiative, uh, it can get pretty crowded. And you're seeing that shrinking down and shrinking down. You're also seeing 
more generalists uh, involved and fewer experts. And you know, while that may sound like it's not a good thing, it, it is a good thing. It's a, it's allowing uh, a lot a lot more versatility, and you're seeing more autonomy as well because as teams become more capable with their techniques and their tools, uh, and they become uh, you know more broadly skilled. Um, you know, they're able to move with more autonomy and come back and provide insights as opposed to, hey, leadership, what do you think of this? It's more, hey, leadership, this is what we found. This is what you should do. Uh, and there's more trust there as a result. And it, in terms of techniques, uh, and everyone's seeing this, of course, test and learn, uh, evidence-driven approaches, design thinking, they're mainstreaming like crazy. These were just a few years ago, uh, you know, emerging ideas that are, are very much mainstreaming now as our ideas like continuous discovery. We used to think of discovery as a phase. Maybe we did it at the beginning, we did some research at the beginning, maybe we did some at the end. Um, now it's constant, it's going on the entire time. We're collecting evidence, for an, it's an ongoing conversation with the marketplace. This is new and we're doing that because it's easier to do now, it's less expensive to do now. So it's not the interruption that it used to be, um, you know, just a few years ago. And on the tool side, fewer, faster, and more capable. And what I mean by that is, you know, where previously we had every every skill set, every department had its own set of tools. There were ideation management tools, there were design tools, there were, pro, there were prototyping tools, of course there still are, but uh, you had research tools, right? And there's, there's a big toolbox and these were all, you know, existed across different groups and, and teams and departments. And so, uh, you know, there was a lot of friction there and moving, moving things forward. And now you're starting to see the platforms converging. First, we started with interoper interoperability, where they were working together and talking together more, and that facilitated a faster movement and better results. And now we're even seeing a new generation of tools just recently coming out that do all of these things on one platform, which is entirely changing the game. And you'll hear more about that a little bit later. But, you know, if you think about it, this is all one trend. Uh, but it's, it's these these three these three trends are so interrelated. They really really come together as one trend, and teams are more nimble and capable than than they've ever been before, and that's exciting. And if we were to look at this in sort of a modeled way, you know, if we were to visualize what I was just talking about, you know, all of these activities, you know, in, historically have been have been teams and departments, right? And so there are a lot of handoffs. There are probably a few turf wars involved. All of them have their own. Uh, skill sets and tool sets, and they're highly specialized. And if we were to look at what's emerging today, it looks a little bit more like this. And, you know, it's somewhere in the middle of this, you'd, you'd have the customers, right? Because we're more, we're less siloed and more focused on customers as opposed to our, our, our departments. But you've got all of these groups now working together. There are far fewer players, far fewer tools. And it's really one, one team now that's, that's pursuing innovation when it's done right, um, which is a much faster process in producing producing better results. So this is what innovation is tending to look like or starting to look like today, uh, which is changing things. And as we thought um, before jumping forward has been a bit conceptual. And again, firm is going to share a great story with us later, but um, does anyone have any comments or questions before we continue on to, to the second half here? Feel free to put them in the Q and A or the comment box. And we'll have time for questions at the end as well, of course. But you know, before we move on to this particular topic, I was inter interested to see if anyone had any thoughts. Right now, uh, we got a response. All good so far. Makes sense. <laughs> okay. Great. Then let's talk about you know two other things that, that are accelerating these trends. Uh, you know, everyone's aware of those trends. They've been coming for a long time. Again, I'd say the last eighteen months have been really eye-opening. And now, you know, now we have new forms of leadership that are emerging to fully take advantage of these trends. And then the no-code and low-code movements, which uh, are also increasing possibilities. So all this is coming together in, in interesting ways. So, you know, new forms of leadership, you know, this is again, David Bland, as you can tell, we're big admirers of his work. Uh, he wrote something a couple of years ago called Leading Through Experimentation. And that's what he calls this, this new form of leadership that in many ways is the antithesis of traditional leadership, right? And Tendai Viki, who is one of the speakers as well, of course, uh, at this event, uh, has been talking about this a great deal lately. And, you know, as he likes to say, you know, when we're thinking of corporate innovators, we think of, uh, you know, mavericks who kick down doors when they enter a room and have very strong opinions. And, and he says, you know, that in many ways, that's, that's the, the, the profile you probably want to filter out because that's not the ideal innovator leadership profile. And, you know, in case we, we start to think maybe this, this is an emerging thing and it's, it's not mainstream yet, it's, uh, it's certain, at least in certain companies, it's, it's very much mainstream. And if you think of Scott Cook uh, from Intuit, you know, this is a quote from him and uh, it's a really great quote and it sort of says it all. You know, th this is the thinking that, that, that innovation teams 
are, are increasingly, you know, seeing at the leadership level. And, you know, another example, of course, is Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, who famously p- pivoted his organization from what he called a know-it-all culture to a learn-it-all culture. And then finally, before we, we jump into Verma's story, um, we'd be remiss in not mentioning the, the no-code and low-code movements, which uh, I'm sure most of us have heard of, but we've got another poll just to get a sense of, um, you know, who's aware of, of these tools and these, these movements that, that, we're, that are in the marketplace, and also uh, who might be using them in their organization to, as part of their innovation efforts. Just think, think Kate might be loading that poll now. There it is. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> there you go. So we're just, just trying to get a general pulse check, uh, you know, um, among our, this group, um, who, you know, who's aware of it? Probably most of us, um, you know, and, and whose organization might actually be using these tools in their efforts. There are the results. So this is interesting. Um, this is, is more of a surprise in the first poll. So, if, you know, half of us have, have, are not aware of it. So good. I'll, we'll talk about it a little bit more then because this is, so it's a really exciting development, and you know, ten percent uh, have are using these tools, which is about about what I expected, um, and about what we've seen. But you're I, you're going to see more and more of this. This is I think in the next five years, I'd be I'd say most enterprises will be using these tools in their in in their innovation efforts. So you know, in, in a nutshell, you know, no code has found its moment. Um, these are all headlines from major publications this year in 2020, uh, and they're pretty breathless. And um, I think it's earned. This is not a passing fad. This is a, this is a, this is earned attention. Um, you know, at a simple level, no code tools are tools that allow you to sort of visually create software. And you know, non-developers, you know, as we like to say, even liberal arts majors, and I'm one of those. So hopefully, no one, nobody's insulted, um, can build software. You know, create functioning, scalable software of increasing sophistication at a very simple level. You know, Squarespace. If you, you know, any anyone on this call can make a, a nice marketing site using Square Squarespace. That's a no-code tool at a very simple level. Shopify is a more sophisticated version of that. But increasingly, we can go beyond making websites to, you know, now there are so many new tools coming out that allow us to create voice bots, for example, or uh, iPhone or Android apps that have uh, e-commerce functionality and live data uh, feeding into them. Um, E-commerce platforms, content uh, websites, you name it. Uh, there's more and more becoming available. So now, as we're innovating and we're testing and we're experimenting, um, you know, we no longer have to go to the IT department or we don't have to ask as much of the IT department. And that's a wonderful thing because they tend to be very backlogged and they also tend to be very expensive, the resources there. So if we can do this ourselves to a certain degree um, before we really need them for the heavy lifting and scaling, once we've proven out an idea, um, that's a beautiful thing. And that's what no code is allowing us to do. So I think uh, for those of you who haven't heard of this or haven't heard much about this, um, keep an eye out because I think you're going to hear more and more and more about it. So it's an exciting, exciting development. So with that, uh, I'm going to turn things over to, to Verma, who, as I mentioned, has a story of a Fortune 500 company um, from a highly regulated industry that was able to launch a brand new product for a new audience in just five months, really leveraging these new developments and trends that we're talking about. Take it away, Verma. Thank you, Scott, and thanks for, thanks for sharing those insights. Um, so I'd love to just spend a little bit of time today talking about how farmers insurance really put a lot of these principles into practice, and in doing so was able to, to create a new product, um, attract a new market segment, and do that in in about a third of the time than it would have traditionally taken them if they'd used sort of um, traditional methodologies. So go to the next slide. I'm gonna be the the next slide person. So so just to give you a little bit of background of what um, Farmers Insurance was sort of facing, the opportunity that was ahead of them. So $1.4 trillion is the sort of the expected purchasing power of millennials this year. So there's this huge segment of the population with an increasing purchasing power. There is 60% of millennials who are renters. This is the highest rate um, of rental compared to previous generations. And not only that, 
millennials are renting for longer periods of time compared to previous generations. But only 40%, less than half of millennials who are renting actually purchase renters insurance. So these three combined, if you're an executive at a large company, sort of, it's an enticing opportunity. But here's the thing about insurance and millennials not many companies have really cracked the code um, there's an old sort of saying in the insurance world that insurance is sold not bought so you really need an intermediary such as an agent to guide you through that purchasing process no one really just sort of go yeah i want to buy i want to buy insurance um, and especially in the millennial segment. So what that meant is to build a new type of product for a new type of market, we have to throw out the, the old playbook. In fact, there is no real, uh, there's no real playbook to follow. There is no HBR article that's being written that you can just you know, glance at and go, okay, I'm going to implement this. So what's required is you know, as Scott sort of led with um, this presentation, we can't build tomorrow using yesterday's tools. So we needed a whole new um, set of tools, techniques and teams. So if we can go to the next slide. So really, this is an example of the, the trends that Scott mentioned earlier. They formed a new team and this was important thing to note about this team that it was fully endorsed and fully led by the CEO, um, Jeff Daly. So there was a leadership sponsorship and buy-in, and I think that's critical. But it brought together people that were traditionally not frequently interact um, in the organization. So where we're talking product design, research, engineering, but also bringing in underwriting ops and business development. We had an autonomous team that could make decisions and didn't need to go outside of that group to progress things forward. They fully embraced um, new techniques to sort of test and learn and experimentation. Um, and, it, and also used tools like agile research platforms, like Alpha to help sort of drive and infuse insight into that process. And so sort of Scott talked a little bit before about low code, no code. I think um, I too ha wasn't that familiar with that term, but one, one thing that that term is really talking about is democratizing. It's putting disciplines that were traditionally the, the domain of an expert into the hands of non-experts. And this is what really fuels innovation. When we can put web development in the hands of non-web developers, if we can put research in the hands of non-researchers, because it's not only researchers that have questions or people that know about research teams that have questions, it's everybody in the organization. So how can we democratize that and put that in front of people? Um, <clears throat> And I see one of the comments, you know, sort of data science and AI. Um, yeah, right now that's the domain of experts um, and code is required. But I hope over time we'll see a democratization of that too. It might not be in one, two years. It might take five, ten years. But hopefully we see that, that, that trend occurring. Um, so what does this new playbook look like? You go to the... Next slide. So sort of premised around the idea of let's not fall in love with ideas. Let's not do endless brainstorming sessions and let's not just come up with the sexiest idea and then implement it. And then, you know, 12 months later, wonder why nobody bought the product. So if I can just interject for, yeah. for a moment, this might be the hardest thing we've, at, we've said today. <laughs> Don't fall in love with ideas and brainstorming, right? It's, uh, it's the least technical, but maybe the most difficult suggestion. Indeed, everyone, everyone loves a good brainstorming session. So, 
Um, sort of behind this principle is the idea, and if we can go to the next slide, um, there's no such thing as a good or bad idea. So that's another thing we have to sort of lead with when collaborating with the farmers' teams. No good ideas, there's no bad ideas. Um, go to the next slide. The, and ideas, ideas are simply clusters of assumptions. So sort of falling in love with ideas, fall in love with dissecting ideas into its underlying assumptions, and let's fall in love with testing, testing those assumptions. So if you, if you think about we want to sort of <clears throat> attract millennial renters, you have a lot of assumptions. I think millennials find insurance too confusing or um, millennials don't think they have anything worth insuring or millennials want personalization or they don't even know about renter's insurance. Going to market, having not validated these can be really costly. So when we think of successful ideas, we think of products going to market where the underlying assumptions have some degree of evidence and validation. Unsuccessful ideas are those products would go to market with unvalidated assumptions and all your validation incurs in real time in market, which is great because it's real, it's real feedback, but it's also the most expensive way to learn that you've built, um, you've built the wrong product. So these unvalidated assumptions can be, can be really, really costly. You go to the next slide. So we wanted to, so when working with farmers, really started by let's get all your assumptions out. Everything you believe to be true about millennials, about renting, about insurance, about their attitudes to insurance, about what you think they want, not only from insurance, but broadly financial services. And let's, let's run experiments to test and validate whether those assumptions are true. Because if they're not, we could drop hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars um, in something that the market doesn't want. And there's a lot of evidence of that. So, so we reframed the new playbook. If we can go to the next slide. It was not about getting ideas to market. It was how do we validate assumptions with real humans continuously? That became the game. It's not about we're rushing to get something out to market where we're really all we're doing all day long is validating assumptions with real humans. And as we get confidence that we've validated, we'll start putting things into production. We'll start, um, you know, making it more real. So if we go to the next slide. What did this look like? So um, the product they released is called Toggle. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what it is. Broadly, you can call it a, a renter's insurance product targeted millennials, but it's, it's, it's also much more than that. So first year alone, ran 175 surveys, 175 assumptions um, were tested against 54,000 um, people within their target audience. So these are small... Um, these are small tests. We're talking samples of, on average, around 300 people targeted around a singular assumption. Do people understand insurance? Like, um, do people value prepackaged bundles or customization? Um, you know, what are, you know, is it a pain point to find, you know, a housemate when renting, all these different things. So it became a really iterative process. You start with a handful of assumptions and as you start getting data back, you learn new things. So they redefined their audience 40 different times. They started with broad millennial, then millennial renters, then millennial renters within specific types of large cities, small cities. Um, Millennials who rent on their own, millennials with housemates, um, high income, low income, 
millennials with kids, uh, you know, millennials with side hustles, millennials who have high valuable items. And so constantly shifting the lens and sort of seeing, okay, where, where is this problem? Are we missing something? Is this more attractive to one audience than another? And because they were getting all this validation, they were able to move with much more confidence. That meant that they weren't waiting around to see if they had the right thing, they knew. And they were able to get their launch time down from which they projected would be about 18 months to around five months. Um, one thing that I should know, notice is, you know, um, only one traditional market research study was done in this, in this period, and that was one um, max diff study. And all it did was confirm the data which was coming out of the experimentation. And so that's what gave them confidence in experimentation. Now that this product's in market, they've actually been able to see that what they learned in testing actually play out in the market. So that's given, you know, double validation to driving this culture of experimentation at farmers. They saw that traditional research methodologies and experimentation data wasn't that far off. They also saw that actual behaviours mirrored what was happening um, in the experiment data. So we can go to the next slide. Verma, so, before, we, before we continue, I'm curious, I'm just looking at these numbers, you know, 175 surveys, 54,000 participants that you touched, you know, 40 specific audience segments, you know, in five months. And I'm thinking, what did that feel like for the team on the ground to make contact with, with that many people and to make sense of that much data? Did they feel like a diver with the bends at the end of all that? Uh, it, it was kind of like, you know, experimentation is kind of like a drug. You know, you traditionally, if you think of the cadence of getting insights in an organization, it might be quarterly. You get a, you get your quarterly report or monthly or even biweekly. Um, but there are still so many questions that are unanswered or so many little things, little judgments you make without any sort of, consumer feedback in that process. So now you have people getting data every three days. So that fuels a new type of behavior. It's like this kind of rush, I'm learning new things. Oh, like, what if I test this? What if I test that? So more questions started bubbling up. As people started seeing the data coming in every couple of days, they were able to, um, you know, follow different paths, you know, people were confused about the term coverage or people didn't know what a deductible or liability was. Let, let's, let's go down that path. Um, so it kind of, you know, you would think it would be overwhelming, but, but it wasn't. It's quite easy to digest a couple of hundred points of data every couple of days. It's, it's not overwhelming, um, especially if you're making a big bet, like, you know, potentially dropping millions in partnerships, in marketing, in product development to, to launch a new product. Um, so Toggle is this really iterative solution. Um, you know, a couple of the interesting things we tested was uh, around how do we get rid of, you know, traditional insurance language. Most insurance products haven't really been updated since the 80s. Um, so, you know, you have insurance of things like grave makers and pewterware, which still exist. So this isn't really enticing to, to millennials. So, but also, how do you price something that you don't have? How do you price renter's insurance? How do I communicate the, the value of insurance? Like, what does $5 a month mean? What does $27.50 a month mean for a product that I don't have, for a class of insurance I might not know about? So sort of leading with testing different ways of communicating this and sort of um, 
you know, the basic is the cost of a coffee or the standard is comparing it to a streaming service and the premium is comparing it to brunch. Okay. These are now things people can identify with and go, okay, well, yeah, like I sacrifice one coffee and I, I, I've got basic coverage. But just even looking at the language, you know, instead of words like dry words like possessions or assets, that's just stuff. Um, why does insurance language have to be so, um, so dry? So this... So if you go to the, the toggle landing page, gettoggle.com, you'll sort of see this very millennial friendly um, language. Go to the next slide. So it's really, oops, you go one back. Yeah. So why experimentation and why this new playbook, which is um, test, learn, sense, respond, why it's so powerful is you don't get pigeonholed into building a particular product. So what would happen in most, what would traditionally happen in insurance companies is say, we need to build a renter's insurance product to attract millennials. So the scope of research tends to focus around renters, renters insurance, very rental focused. Um, and you've already sort of predefined what the product is. It's like, oh, we're going to build a renters insurance product. So you start benchmarking across the competition. And what you end up with is a pretty me too type of product. You know, this, yeah, I, I've also got a renters insurance product. But when you experiment, you start learning things about the underlying needs, attitudes, pain points of the individual. You learn that they don't think of renting in isolation. They, think of, they don't think of their possession sort of in the house and just in the house. They might travel with it. They might have, um, their house might be the place of work if they have a side hustle. They might have pets in there. So, you know, they, they're thinking of financial protection, okay? They're thinking about credit and finance. As you start building this really interesting picture around what, how broad is rental? What does that really mean? And, how, and if we're really to capture this market, how do we go, go about that? So if we go to the next slide is the toggle product is more than just, you know, basic renters insurance. There is, you know, standard stuff where, you can include high value items, but there's also, it incorporates rewards. So um, reductions in deductibles for every claim free year. They recognize that people have side hustles. So if you have an expensive camera for wedding photography, an expensive sewing machine, that's sort of covered as well. You might have pets that destroy everything. Those things are, are covered. You might take your possessions on the road with you. You might take your laptop while you travel. That's covered um, while you travel. And also credit. Um, how can you get credit for all your rental payments? So they, they partner with a company to ensure that if you can show proof of your rental payments, it will improve, um, uh, improve your credit. So these are all the things that were sort of, that came out of these 175 different tests and experiments. It's really, these were the things that were important. And it's called Toggle because one of the leading things that we learned really early on was the importance of personalization. That millennials want to be able to toggle things on and off to suit their needs. If they don't have high value items, they turn it off. If they don't have pets, they can turn it off or they can turn it on. If they don't travel, they can turn that off as well. So um, and another really interesting thing was, you know, a lot of companies, a lot of large organizations are trying to build, you know, spin off companies. And if you see that, if we go back to the previous slide, um, that's Toggle, a farmer's insurance company. That's actually something we, we tested 
around what engenders trust. Um, yes, millennials are really excited by new things and um, using layman's terms and sort of, you know, a slick non-traditional website and really sort of simple to add and remove things from your policy. But the historical brand, a well-recognised brand, helps to, um, you know, engender trust. And that's such an important thing when we're talking about financial products, especially insurance products. You want to know that um, it's underwritten by a reputable company and that if something goes wrong, that, that you know, it's going to be backed by you know, a trusted leader in this space. So um, that, I'm just going to sort of, sort of leave, leave it there and really, um, you know, happy to sort of answer any questions that, that you might have. Great, thank you both very much. Um, I actually see uh, well, someone does have their hand raised. Um, Claudia David, uh, would you like to come on mic and uh, ask your question? Just need to unmute yourself. Maybe. We were having some issues there. Okay, uh, we'll come back to you, <laughs> no worries. Uh, I do see that uh, Ivan, uh, yes, you also have your hand up. You have a question, go ahead. Hello, hello, this is, uh, this is Ivan. And uh, I, I know the Alpha guys, I, I, had a, uh, I had the pleasure of having a, a very memorable uh, dinner here in Miami Beach with, uh, with Thor, which was uh, one of the, uh, <laughs> when, he, when he does dinner, he does dinner, man. It was, it was <laughs> <laughs> uh, he does indeed. I'm uh, sure. Yeah, he's he's a, he's a fun guy. Um, so my, my question is about is about um, how do you help the process of of coming up with 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 things to test, right? Because although it's although it's it's faster and cheaper than ever to test ideas, it doesn't mean you should you should you should. Um, I mean, it still it still doesn't preclude a smart process of trying to, you know, um, find the right things to test. So, so yeah. on the creativity side or on, on how do you unlock kind of the um, getting off the beaten track and that, because Millennium World is, 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 is a great example where I'm sure, you know, if you're in a room where people have been in the industry, you know, you talk about that's, that's how things have always been done, right? And how do you, how do you facilitate the process of, of thinking out of the box and coming up with, with testable ideas where people say, it sounds crazy, but hey, you know, let's just test it out, right? But with, and without going crazy and starting to test things where you're going completely overboard and, and, and maybe there's no such thing as going overboard, right? But again, yeah. there's, there's a limit in terms of time and resources of the number of tests you can, you can do, right? So my question yeah. is about how do, you, how do you kind of manage the, the top of the funnel of experimentation, I guess. That's yeah, a that's, a, that's a great question. I'll, I'll, I'll kick that off and Scott, feel free to um, jump in as well. Um, I think <clears throat> firstly, it's about dissecting the ideas into its underlying assumptions. Um, what do you believe to be true? What are the conditions that really need to be true for this product to be successful? And if these things aren't true, um, we're in real danger of building something that people don't want. So there's this process of, of extracting the underlying assumptions. One of the easiest ways starting points is I always ask, teams, where is there debate internally at your company? Where do you and your colleagues disagree on something? Okay, great. That's a good proxy for two people having a different version of what the truth is. And that's when objective customer data can come in. But, but let's say you have 100 assumptions. You're right. You only have a finite amount of time and you don't want to waste that time. Um, you, it's prioritizing it around how much evidence do you have? A lot of times teams test things they already know, um, especially as they're getting their feet wet with experimentation. Like, you know these, you live and breathe in this environment. So let's not start there. Let's really be honest. And what are your real unknowns? So let's first identify them. These are the things that have no evidence. These are genuinely unknowns. They could go in either direction. 
And then secondly, what is the impact of that? What if one of those we think is right is actually wrong? Is it a high impact or is it like, ah, it won't really matter. We can iterate on it in the next sprint. Or is it this fundamentally challenges the, the proposition that we want to go to market with? So I think first it's identifying the assumptions and then classifying them by how much evidence do we have, starting with the ones that have no evidence, uh, and then um, looking at impact, which ones have no evidence, and if they're wrong, um, can materially impact whether this product is successful or not in the market. Yeah, that's, that's very helpful. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks, Bruno. I, I would just add uh, quickly that, you know, there's a learning curve there, of course, too. Like once you've decided to work this way, you're going to be more inefficient early, right? You're going you're to run down a lot of dead ends, but then you'll quickly get better at it and become more efficient. And that is on a project by project basis as well. Um, I tell you one thing, I do this for a living and I was astounded by the amount of ground they covered on this toddle project in terms of how many people they spoke with and how much research they did. So th that was an eye opener for me in terms of, um, you know, how much you can get done, even if you, you know, half of that research maybe wasn't as fruitful as the other half. Yeah. And I think just building on that, that quote that you, um, you put out from Scott Cook at Intuit. Um, if, you're always striving to get the cost of experimentation down and do it quicker. Um, the number of questions you have doesn't become a limitation. So it's a limitation now because um, there's only so much we can test in a given amount of time with a given amount of resources. You know, five years ago, it might have been 20 things a year. Now we might be able to do, you know, five, 600 things a year. In a couple of years time, if we continue investing in getting the cost of experimentation down and the speed of experimentation down, um, sure, test everything. And if you have 500 things, even if they're frivolous, test them because the cost is essentially zero, but the value that you will learn something from that. Maybe you learn it's not frivolous and it's worth testing. So I think there's a the tension there. Now that we have to work within the limitations of what exists, but if we follow Scott Cook's advice and try to get the cost of experimentation and the speed of experimentation down, um, uh, we, can, we don't have to be that uh, rigorous in prioritizing. We can test everything, but that's the vision. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you Thanks, both. Ivan. Yeah. Any uh, any further questions? Uh, don't be shy. Uh, this is our this is your time uh, to kind of dig in and, and ask. You know, no question too small or too. <laughs> uh, Shannon, uh, yes. Would you like to come on? I see your hand is raised. Thank you. Thank you both for this really great information. My company is just at the beginning of our innovation work, so. This is all new territory for me, so I'm just being a sponge at this conference. Scott, I think my question is probably more directed to you, though, Verma. Please feel free to, to jump in. I mean, you're talking about experimentation and a large number of surveys. I work in a healthcare uh, very niche uh, segment, and so I have to deal with, with HIPAA, and I also deal with a very small budget like basically zero. Um, so when you're looking at a smaller organization that just doesn't have the resources, we don't even have, um, you know, software developers on, on staff to develop any coding, much less product managers or engineers. Um, what ideas or thoughts do you have to share or experiences do you have for a much smaller organization that is, both uh, resource and uh, human constrained. Yeah, thanks, Shannon. That's a that's a great question, uh, and not a, and not an easy question. Um, but you know, we, teams are getting smaller, as I mentioned early on, and uh, that's a good thing. And I think that also makes small teams more capable. 
uh, as well. You know, like what's available t- today in terms of tools, um, you don't have any developers, but there are these no code tools that you can, you know, learn pretty quickly. Uh, they won't all apply to your situation, uh, but you know, it, it's worth maybe taking a look at them to see if you can just bypass the whole development thing, right? That's something that we can do now that we couldn't do even a few years ago. Although there's not a tool for everything, there there are a tool for a lot of things. And your small team might actually be an advantage because you can communicate and you can move and you can make decisions fast. And there are, again, tools, but you don't even need to use tools all the time to do that kind of research. And where you have these privacy issues, um, you know, what we found is just, is finding proxies can be helpful. I don't know if that might, you know, would be possible in your situation or not. But, you know, wherever there are privacy concerns or regula- regulatory concerns, you can often get the information you need through proxies. In other words, we're not going to talk to our actual patients or customers. Um, we're going to talk to similarly situated people to get the insights that we need. And that oftentimes can work. But there are just so many quick and dirty ways to, to gather insights um, that don't involve a big investment. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, kind of maybe talking, asking questions like this, talking to folks who've done it um, and just running, running, starting to run experiments as soon as possible. Uh, Verma, would you add anything to that? Yeah, I'd say that like, there's only three, three real sort of uh, ingredients uh, you need for a running experiment. You need, you need the people, you need just sort of someone who represents your target audience. Um, you need something that they can react to. So you can use anything from hand-drawn sketches to PowerPoints, and then you need a way to sort of measure and evaluate that. And that's sort of basic synthesis of that data. The biggest challenge often in regulated industries and in small companies is where do I find the people? Um, So I think it's looking at resources that you might already have. Um, Do you have a customer service team that regularly interacts with them? Can they be a source of insight? Do you have a sales team that's talking with customers um, uh, all the time? You can, um, you can place ads, you can reach out to networks, depending on the type of patient group that, that, you're, that you're looking for. Um, so you can be sort of creative in where you find these people. I think the really important thing is, what do you do with these people once you have them? Like, how do you delineate between what they say and what they'll do. And this is why using things like prototypes is really important because you're, tr- you're really going for that reaction. You're trying to put something visual in front of them that they can react to because um, that's where the, that real feedback comes from. Um, we do a lot of work in regulated industries. So like it can be done. We do a ton in healthcare. I think it's just really understanding the core thing you need to be sort of um, cautious of when doing this is whatever you're doing cannot be perceived as marketing to that individual. So there's usually by virtue of you paying participants to provide feedback that immediately sort of eliminates the barrier. People know they're in a simulation. People know that they're in, um, they're providing feedback. There's no misunderstanding that you're trying to market anything. And this is also why it's really important to focus on the underlying assumptions because you can tell, you can tell with like, you know, 80% confidence whether a product is going to be successful or not without ever revealing the product to the individual. You can just focus on the behaviors, on the assumptions. Are people confused about the term deductible? So if, a product, if I'm leading with marketing message around low deductible and people don't know what the word deductible means, who cares what the product is? No one's going to buy it. <laughs> um, so there are, there are sort of ways that you can be scrappy. And by definition, experimentation is scrappy. Um, so, you know, think about ways you can find people. Think about quick, crude ways you can mock something up and put it in front of them. Um, and you'll be, you'll be like, you know, most of the way there. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's one of the themes of this session, right? That the resource constraints are less constraining than they've ever been. We, we, we have to we have to reach out to the experts or other departments, which might be our habit, 
oh, we, have, we need the development team, but they don't have time for us. We need the research department, but they don't have time for us. We're now, we can just, we don't need to do that anymore. It might be our habit, but we can be more self-sufficient. Great. Shannon, did that answer your, your question? You have any follow-ups or? <laughs> no, but having a research team or customer service team is certainly a pipe dream. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, hopefully that was somewhat helpful. <laughs> no, it, it just helps put some more context around everything. Um, I guess I do have one little follow up and, you know, we can take this offline too is, you know, you're talking about um, different tools and techniques and this no code. Um, what are, and this is obviously without sitting here and doing a Google search, um, are there some good places to go to look at resources to learn more about the different resources and platforms that are out there. Cause you're talking about different testing platforms. I wouldn't even know what I was looking for. Yeah, that's a great question too. Yes. The answer is an emphatic yes. And you'll find them pretty quickly. If you start doing searches on Google, you'll find some great uh, introductory articles. You'll find some great platforms. MakerPad uh, is one great source of, of, of information that lists a lot of the tools and there's a community there. Uh, it's a good place to start. And they also have uh, additional links. You'll very quickly start to, to find answers to your questions because there, there, are, there are a lot of tools out there. I appreciate that. Thank you. Sure. Great. Uh, any other questions? Um, we'll start to maybe uh, wrap up if you'd like, give some, some time for both of you to provide any last thoughts. Uh, next steps, anything like that? <laughs> Where to go? <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no next steps. Just wanted to thank everyone for participating and, and uh, hopefully uh, you got a lot out of the session and, uh, you know, I'll be around in the community in the forums and uh, I've been active there. Uh, any follow-up questions, uh, my contact details are there and, and here and would love to continue the conversation. Likewise, just feel free to, uh, Email Scott and myself um, if you have any questions, and we're we're happy to 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 go deep and um, chat about any of the things that we mentioned today. Wonderful. Well, thank you both so much. Uh, and like Scott mentioned, uh, continue to ask your questions on the community platform. Um, they're both there and active, and so we can uh, definitely answer more questions or email them directly if you want to dive deep. And uh, Thank you again so much, both of you, for joining us and for your time. This was a wonderful session, and we look forward to seeing you all in the next one. So wishing you all a great day or evening, whichever. <laughs> Thanks, Kate. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Thank everyone. Thank you all.